Welcome back to another top 5 video. Today we're going to be focusing on 5 tanks you never knew about. The key feature for a vehicle to have made it onto this list is that it has to have existed in at least a partially produced form. No cardboard mockups or blueprint tanks are on this list. An example of a cardboard mockup would be the German World War II Flak Panzer Koalien. The Koalien was a proposed solution to tackle the onslaught of Allied fighter bombers. Two 37mm guns would be within an enclosed armoured turret mounted upon a panther chassis. A wooden mock-up turret was mounted onto the panther. No actual Koalien turrets were produced due to high demand for panther chassis in the typical tank role. An example of a blueprint tank would be the Panzer VII Lova. The Lova was designed to be a super heavy tank. Its frontal armour was 140mm thick and was sloped for additional effectiveness. The main cannon would have been 10.5cm. Total weight was estimated to be around 90 tons. The tank never made it off the drawing board. With the intro out of the way, let's get on with the video. Number 5. The Marshal. The Marshal is a Romanian tank destroyer prototype. While this tank did not have an effect on the battlefield, it's what this tank inspired that is important. That being the German tank destroyer the Jagdpanzer 38, aka the Hetzer. The Hetzer is said to have been inspired by the Marshal, depending on what sources you look at. The Hetzer went on to be one of the most cost-effective late-war German tanks. I'll explain how the development of the Marshal influenced the Hetzer. The Marshal was developed due to Romania wanting a tank that could compete with the Russian T-34 and KV-1. The Russian leap forward in armour technology caught the Germans and the Romanians off guard. The likes of the T-26 and the BT-5s were replaced with T-34s and KV-1s. Romania's light tanks couldn't handle these new Russian tanks unless they fired from very close ranges and with side and rear shots. A new type of tank was needed to deal with this new generation of Russian armour. A large cannon on a light tank chassis would be the easiest way to design and build a new tank capable of competing with the new Russian tanks. With its small arms industry, Romania needed a tank with good cost effectiveness and these influences were taken into the tank's design. Dedicated tank destroyers with no rotating turret have several benefits over what we see as conventional tank design. No turret means less resources are used per tank. Low profile makes the tank easier to camouflage and harder to hit. Another benefit is that the frontal armour can be stronger as the tank should be facing what it is engaging. This is done at the sacrifice of the rear and side armour thickness. The Marshal's armour, while thin, is heavily angled to increase the effective armour thickness. Even with the Marshal's relatively thin armour, it was able to stop rounds from a T-34, at least the early version with the 76mm gun, from medium ranges, and only if it hit the frontal armour. Development began in late 1942. The first prototype Marshal tank used a Russian T-60 tank chassis to mount a 122mm howitzer. With the first prototype, there were some teething issues, such as their weight of the gun, causing the tank's suspension to lean forwards. Funnily enough, the Hetzer also had the same issue with its early development. After some time, the newer prototypes of the Marshal had changed. The T-60 chassis was replaced with a Romanian-designed chassis. The main gun was changed to a 75mm anti-tank gun. The Marshal never saw mass production as Romania had capitulated before production had begun and only a handful of various prototypes were produced. The Soviet Union confiscated all the equipment related to the project. While not solely designed for a defensive war, the Marshal was an interesting idea. Using a proven light tank chassis avoids issues that heavy tank destroyers in Germany were having at the time. On paper, the Jagdtiger is impressive with its 128mm gun it would eliminate the heaviest of allied armour. Extra frontal armour would prevent any rounds from entering the vehicle. And then you read reports about its combat performance and all the issues that came with it. It's a long time joke about German heavy tanks and their transmissions. Think of the poor transmission on the 70 ton beast every time it needed to align up with a target. The Hetzer used an outdated but proven tank chassis, the Panzer 38T. There were some slight modifications such as larger road wheels, wider tracks and stronger springs to accommodate the larger gun. But these changes were relatively simple to make compared to designing a new tank destroyer from scratch. During World War II almost 3000 Hetzers were produced from 1944 to 1945. 
Germany's Ministry of Arms, Albert Speer, saw something in this tank. Many manufacturing facilities were dedicated for producing just parts for Hetzers. Panzer IV production was ended to increase the number of factories available for manufacturing parts for the Hetzer. To try and put the cost effectiveness of this vehicle into perspective, take a guess of how heavy a Hetzer weighs. Go on, you have 3 seconds. 3, 2, 1. Time's up. 17 tons. That's less heavy than a King Tiger's turret. Number 4, the Grosskampfwagen, aka the K-Wagen. German World War I tanks. All there is to show of it is the German Breadbox tank, or you can call it by its real name, the Sturmpanzerwagen, or the A7V. The Breadbox suffered from low ground clearance, meaning it wasn't too successful at traversing the terrain of the battlefields. It also had a whole host of other design issues, with only 20 of them built, their combat experience was limited. The blockade on Germany meant resources were low, Nevertheless, it was decided to build super heavy tanks, a rolling fortress that would shatter an enemy's defence no matter how entrenched they were, ideal for achieving a breakthrough in a stalemate that was the Western Front. The K-Wagon was this tank. Only two K-Wagons were partially produced, they were in their final stages of construction as the war ended. They never left their factories or moved under their own power. These two 120 ton beasts were armed with four 77mm guns that could fire shells weighing up to 7 kilograms. Additionally, seven machine guns would be scattered around the vehicle. It's estimated that it would have a crew of possibly up to 27 men. The power plant was two engines, delivering a total of 1,300 horsepower. Top speed was estimated to have been 7 kilometers per hour. That speed was in good conditions. I wonder what the off-roading speed would have been. Due to its large size, the K-Wagon was designed modularly so that it could be broken down into several sections to make transportation by rail easier. At its thickest point, the armour was 30mm thick. For comparison, the British Mark IV had around 12mm of armour at its strongest point. How would this vehicle have fared on the battlefield? I don't think it would have done very well. After its appearance on the battlefield, it probably would have been shelled out of existence. Its wide profile makes for a large target, and its speed most certainly makes it anything but nimble. With enough shells, it would have gotten disabled before it did anything dangerous to the front. The German War Ministry ordered for 10 K-Wagons to be built, but only two were partially built. There are not too many photos of the K-Wagons, and I like this photo the most as it shows both of them in the same factory under construction. After the war, both of the tanks were scrapped. Number 3. The Flak Panzer IV, aka the Kugelblitz. The Kugelblitz is an anti-aircraft variant of the Panzer IV. In place of a main turret is a ball with two autocannons sticking out. While there are several other anti-aircraft versions of the Panzer IV, such as the Whirlwind, the Mobile Wagon, and the Ostwind, the Kugelblitz was special as it had an enclosed turret. The main armament was two Mark 103 cannons. These cannons fired 30mm shells at a rate of 450 rounds per minute. The heavier shells could weigh just under 1kg, Theoretically, the vehicle could fire continuously for 90 seconds. Firing all 1,200 of the 30mm rounds in one go would have caused the guns to jam, even possibly permanently damage the guns from overheating. There was no room for extra ammunition storage, so more ammunition would need to be sourced from ammunition carriers to reload. With the end of Panzer IV production making room for the Hetzer, there were very few Panzer IV chassis left for testing of a prototype. One aspect of this tank that I see rarely discussed is how the crew operated the turret. In most tanks, the crew stay in place whether the main gun is elevated or depressed. In the Kugelblitz, the crew were fixed to the same elevation of the twin guns. If the turret was elevated, the crew would be looking upwards. If the turret was depressed, the crew would be pointing down. Operating the vehicle in these conditions must have been very difficult and demanding. Forget the fact that the gun actually needs to be trained on low attacking planes. Only 5 prototype turrets were completed, with only 3 of them being mounted on Panzer IVs. They were still in the testing phases as the war ended, so they never saw action. There is a rumour that one of the turrets was used in the defence of a town, but it is not proven. Number 2. The Waffentrager Waffentrager means weapons carrier in English. This term is interchangeable with other tanks such as the 10.5cm Waffentrager, 
So what I'm referring to for this bit of the video are three late war tanks that are rather similar. The Ardent Rheinmetall, the Krupp Stör, and the Ardent Krupp. Basically, several different companies tasked with building the same thing. With the new Soviet heavy tanks arriving on the Eastern Front in 1943, there was a higher demand for heavy anti-tank guns. The Pac-43 was an 88mm anti-tank gun. It weighed 4.5 tons making it not very mobile. It was rather common for Pac-43s to be blown up by their own crews to prevent the enemy capturing them. With the Soviet rapid advancements, it was difficult to organise for heavy anti-tank guns transportation to new locations. To try and reduce the losses, it was decided to develop these guns into self-propelled anti-tank guns. What makes the Waffentrager different from previous self-propelled guns was the odd requirements laid out by the military. The turret had to be able to rotate 360 degrees. This was so that the vehicle wouldn't have to align its hull with the target it wanted to engage. Another odd requirement was that the Waffentrager needed to be able to elevate up to 45 degrees so it could be used in an artillery role. The other criteria for this tank are more standard. Not taller than 1.5 meters, easy to maintain, radio equipment. The official requirements for armour protection was to be 20mm at the front and 10mm at the sides. It was also asked for the tank to be able to achieve a speed of 35 km per hour. Germany needed less of a tank and more of a mobile gun solution. It had to be cheap to build and simple to run, ideally using equipment that already existed. The question then became, how can we fit a Pac-43 on a small tank chassis? That's what I find so derpy about this tank. Really big gun, tiny base. It's quite amusing in some of the photos of the Waffentragers seeing the suspension coping with the large gun. It's the same cannon from the King Tiger, but on such a tiny chassis. The Waffentrager 88 was almost part of the German E-Series program. The E-Series tanks were meant to streamline late war German tank design. The E-10 being tank destroyers, E-25 medium tanks, E-50 Heavy Tanks, E-100 Super Heavy Tanks. The most well-known E-Series tank being the E-100, a tank similar to the Mouse sporting a 128mm gun. The E-100 was only partly developed with one hull semi-completed. The Waffentrager was proposed for the E-10, but was replaced with a prototype design that was never produced. The Waffentrager was intended to be as simple as possible. So simple that the turret could even be lifted off and placed onto a fixed mounting for a static defence, which ironically increased the complexity, so this design feature was dropped before producing any actual working prototypes. The first Waffentrager to be completed was the Ardent Rheinmetall Waffentrager. The prototype went through testing where it drove off-road and fired live rounds. It fired 129 rounds before suffering damage to the muzzle brake. With a minor repair, it was able to fire 300 rounds before the firing tests were concluded. Only one working prototype was completed. The Krupp Steyr Waffentrager was the second to be completed. Krupp made the turret and Steyr made the hull. One working prototype was completed. It's rather similar in design to the Ardent Rheinmetall Waffentrager. Only one prototype of this design was made. The last Waffentrager to be completed was the Ardent Krupp Waffentrager. This Waffentrager was the highest up the list of priority for development. It had the tracks from a RSO artillery tractor, the suspension of a Panzer 38T. Most of its parts were recycled from other vehicles that already existed. Its max speed was around 25 km per hour and it could carry 40 rounds of ammunition. The gun shield was a compromise to protect the crew from small arms fire and possibly shrapnel. Ideally, it would have been all round protection the sides and rear of the enclosed turret were gone to make construction easier. There was an order for 100 Ardent Waffentragers placed. This order included a few of a munition carrying variant. There was some delay in production, but in the end, 7 Waffentragers were completed. These did see use with tank hunter teams. The tanks saw action in the defence of El Devada. It is even said that some of the Ardent Krupp Waffentragers were committed in the Battle of Berlin. There's still one of these Waffentragers on display in the Kubenka Tank Museum. All the other variants whereabouts are unknown. Number 1. The Bogwood 4. The Bogwood 4 is an ammunition transporter. Or is it? Maybe it's a remote controlled mine detonator. 
Now it's a giant Goliath tracked mine. Nope, now someone strapped six Panzer Shreks to it and called it an anti-tank gun. This vehicle did lead an interesting life. While not very useful, it did make for an interesting platform to test out ideas. To break down this section of the video, I'll cover the life of the Bogwood and its role throughout the war. The Bogwood was originally designed and used as an ammunition transporter. Its speed and mobility would allow it to keep up with fast moving armoured and mechanised divisions. In this role, the Bogwood was not very useful as it was underpowered and couldn't carry much cargo. After the French campaign, it was decided to design a way for the Bogwood 4 to be able to drop explosives. A design was made with 500 kilograms of explosives in an armoured bin attached to the front of the chassis. The Bogwood 4 would be remotely operated to drive up to enemy positions, drop its payload and then fall back. The explosives could be detonated and the vehicle could continue to be used again. These explosives could be used against strong points or for clearing minefields. For clearing out minefields there were two configurations. It could be used to blast a safe area of around 40 meters wide within a minefield. If a bogwood were to hit a mine, it would still clear out a 40 meter wide area and another bogwood would be brought in to continue the steady process. Driving into the minefield, dropping a bomb and falling back for rearming. The second configuration was a system of heavy iron rollers set up in front of the bogwood. The bogwood would then be driven through a minefield with the heavy rollers safely detonating any of the mines it could hit. Unlike other demolition vehicles such as the Goliath and the Springer, the exciting feature of the Bogwood is that it could be controlled via radio. The Goliath used a wire to connect back to the operator. Several tanks were fitted with extra radio equipment to allow them to control the Bogwoods to their final destination. The most common tanks to have this radio equipment were the Panzer III and the Stug III. Even several Tigers had extra radio equipment, but not many. The Bogwood 4 could be radio controlled up to around 2 kilometers away from its operator. Out of combat, the Bogwood could be driven like the original ammunition carrier design. Near the target area, the driver would dismount and the vehicle could then be used in its intended role. Further into the war, it was decided to forego the armored bin and just use the entire vehicle packed with explosives as a radio remote controlled bomb. There were three variants of the Bogwood 4. The A variant had a top speed of just under 40 km per hour. It had 10 mm of frontal armor with 5 mm on the side and rear. The B variant's changes are so minor that I'll pass over them. The C variant of the Bogwood 4 had several upgrades over the original model based on feedback. The chassis was extended to accommodate a more beefed up engine. The frontal armor was increased to 20 mm. Out of the original contract for 400 of the C variant, the Ministry of Arms cancelled the contract down to 322 as they were trying to standardize German manufacturing. For the Battle of Berlin, Bogwoods were refitted to become anti-tank vehicles. There were 56 Bogwoods that were converted. Its full designation was Bogwood B4 Ausführung mit Raketenpanzerbüchse 54. Little exists of their combat reports. The general idea was that they were not very successful. Around 1,200 Bogwood 4s of all varieties were made throughout the war. Interestingly, only 4 are currently on display. Not many did survive the war. There were a few one-off test Bogwoods. One of these was an amphibious Bogwood. Another test utilized a camera to test remote control operation with the assistance of a live TV video feed. Just like other desperate late war attempts, the Bogwood 4's later variants are a desperate attempt to make a useful weapon out of any available parts. That's the overall theme in this video. The Marshal was Romania's last ditch attempt to make a tank destroyer, leading to Germany's last ditch ambushing tank destroyer. The Grosskampfwagen was an attempt to put a large amount of resources into a weapon that could break the stalemate of the trenches. The Kugelblitz was an attempt to develop an anti-fighter bomber solution. The enclosed turret would protect the crew from strafing attacks. The Waffenträgers were an attempt to field the long 88 guns onto motorized chassis to keep them mobile for flexible retreating defense. The Bogwood and its variants reflect how desperate the situation was. First a reusable bomb deployer, then the entire vehicle used as a bomb, and the final version being used as a platform for carrying several fixed Panzerschrecks. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching. If you like this, there are many more videos like this on my YouTube channel, so if you have the time, please check them out.